Today is uh, the uh, 19th of oh, you got him. Okay. April. More forms to replace yours. Yes, um, 19th of April. 2013. 2013. And we're here in the home of um, Gerald Wank, better known as Jerry. And I'm Bill Volano with the Veterans History Project. Um, Pleased to meet you, sir. Good to meet you, and I'm happy uh, and I'm thankful that you're making this time for me. Tell me, um, you, you're, you're living in Chelsea now, but yes. were you born in Chelsea? Right up here where the post office is. Oh, is that right? Where the old post office. Uh huh. Like the second light up here. Oh, yeah, yeah. That used to be a hospital. Oh? I was born there in 1931. Uh huh. And lived here all my life except for the three years that I was in the Army. Mm -hmm. I enlisted for two years. And then the Korean War broke out. And we got Uncle Harry's extra year. Oh, yes. So we all, my discharge day, I was eight days out from San Francisco heading for Japan. <laughs> what, what, uh, what's the actual birth date? What's your birth date? 8 25 31. August? Yep, August 25th. 25th, uh huh. Um, I'm, what, I'm. August, September, October, I'm uh, 10 months older than you are. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll be 82 this, yeah, this August. And I'll be 83 in October. Yeah, we still got something more for Yeah, to right, right. <laughs> you say you enlisted for two years and yes. Harry Truman kind of extended you a little bit. Well, as you know, I thought it was safe to enlist. World War II was done. Yeah? Mm hmm And my buddy Roy Gunther, he went with me. Him and I went in together. And we thought, well, let's, let's go into service. I was 17 years old. He was 18. I quit school to go in service. And I said, well, I, I have to go now and get it over with. Uh -huh. And we'll finish up after we get out. So we went down and we enlisted. And we got the three-day pass to come back home and get our everything done home before we left. And him and I went in together. We took basic training together. Mm -hmm. And then a very, very good friend of mine from Lansing, Ray Allen, then the Korean War broke out. He left first. Well, Roy and I did our basic training. And then at the end of it, we took the advanced basic. And then they had you know, a questionnaire, what, what, what would you like to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, both of us thought, now what we should do is get into something that we could use in civilian life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the first thing we came up with is construction, because they're always going to be building. Mm -hmm. So we both put in for heavy school equipment. Mm -hmm. Well, we were doing our basic, our advance, and called Roy off the side and pack your bags. He said, you're going to Virginia. Going down to the engineers. Oh, in Fort Belvoir? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe I'll go there too. You uh -huh. know? And it went on, and Roy packed up, and he left. And he called my name out, said, pack up your bag, and Jeep pick you up. Okay. So I went in the barracks, I packed up everything, turned my rifle in, got, got in the Jeep, and I said, where are we going? And I thought it was going to take me down to the train station or something. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll show you when we get there. Mm -hmm. I said, we're not leaving the post? And he said, no. He said, just no, wait a minute. That's not good news. <laughs> and what is it? We went down past the NCO club and took a left, went up the hill, and here's the cemetery. I looked around and he said, here's your home. And I said, well, where am I at? He said, this is heavy, heavy tank company. First sergeant come over there and shook my hand. And he says, welcome to heavy tank company. I said, I thought I was going to get into some heavy equipment at school that I could learn. He said, that thing weighs about 37 tons, thousand tons. He said, you'll be all right, it's heavy. And I said, oh boy. I said, well, where is everybody? And he said, well, he says, just 12 of you right now. So I was the 12th one in the company just started. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. 
But we did our, went through our basic training with the tanks. And then we finally got one tank. It was on Sunday. First sergeant come in, I was laying on my bed. He said, come on, Wink. He said, get, you, get, get dressed. He said, you gotta go with me. Okay. So I got dressed. I said, where are we going? He's jumping the Jeep. And he said, you know, I'm going down the ordinance. So, okay. So we went down to ordinance and we got the first tank. He just come up here. I crawled up. He says, jump down the side. And I said, okay. He said, that's how you start it. And he said, prime it. Said, prime it. Turn the switch on. Turn the mags on. He said, pump it about 25 times. And he said, and then hit the switch. Put both of them together to make needles. I did, and I think I fired right up. I looked at him, he said, no, he said, follow me back up to the company. I said, oh, wait a minute, how you, I, you know, I got to look at it, I could see the shift pattern. Mm -hmm. And so I'm rumbling along behind him, and I thought, God, if he stops, I'm going to stop this thing. Yeah, I figured you got to pull the laterals, I guess maybe that's the way to stop it. We got back up to the company and parked it, that's the first, the only take sitting in the whole parking lot. He said, now he said, you're going to be my driver instructor. I thought, okay, we'll do that. Your driver instructor? Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, but we had, uh, we went to, actually though, after uh, when we got ready to go to Korea, we had to turn everything in. Mm -hmm. Well, I came home to pick up my new car. I bought a new car from uh, Spalding Chevrolet. And my mother called me and said, your car is ready. Well, we were at the Pine Camp, New York, given the nomenclature of the tanks and how the tanks and the infantry worked as a, as a team. Mm -hmm. With the radio on the back of the tank, and you can call in and talk to you. Just so on and so forth. And I used to give the, the, the nomenclature of the tank in Hawaii. It was all the officer reserve corps was up there. Well, I came home to get my car and I sat in the front porch for 20 minutes where my mother finally got out of bed. I hitchhiked to him. She said, well, what are you doing? I said, just coming home to get my car. Well, she said, first you got to call your company commander. She said, here's his number. I said, well, okay. So I called up. Well, I got the first Saturday. He said, if we're not here in, in Pine Camp, go all the way back to Devon's. He said, we'll meet you there. I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, we're getting ready to leave. And he said, I ain't telling you where we're going. And I said, okay. So I got my cousin, called him. He was in college. And his buddy, and they was going to ride back with me and bring my car back. Because I wanted to drive that dead gone thing before I got left to go wherever we was going. Well, then I found out there was a Korean War was going on. I know where we're going now, mm -hmm. no doubt. So I drove up to, we got to Pine Camp and they were already gone. There was a guy there at the gate and he said, just keep going. So we passed the company going up through the mountain. They was all loaded on trucks. And we got back to Fort Devons and pulled up in front of the orderly room. And Lieutenant Euler was there, an old World War II vet. He looked at me and he said, that's your car wink? And I said, yes, sir. He said, that's too bad. And I said, what do you mean it's too bad? He said, it's going to be an antique before you get home, son. I said, you think so? He said, we'll be leaving from California, but he said, I'll bet you a $100 bill will come back. We'll come back through New York. MacArthur gets his way. He says, we're going right straight through Germany, or through uh, China. And we're going to go all the way around through Russia, and we'll come back this way. Well, my cousin and his buddy, they took off with my car. When we got ready to leave, of course, you had to take all the chevrons off, patches. It was on a troop train. And we started our journey. To North, Massachusetts? Yeah, from Massachusetts train? all the way to, to San Francisco. There was one catch. The whole division was leaving. So the one from Fort Benning, Georgia, they, they went straight to, right straight to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Being the 7th Infantry Regiment 
the third Avengers division. We took the zigzag. We went from Boston to Florida to New York, to down to Georgia, back up, mm -hmm. all the way across the United States. It took us, I don't know how long to get there by train. We stopped every morning, done calisthenics. They had a, they had a chow wagon right there in, the, in one car. And we got to California, and then I got stuck on the advance detail to go down to the ship. Well, I took the top bunk right up by the vent system. I figured somebody's going to get sick. I'm going to be up here and not over there. <laughs> yeah. We got the priest with everybody loaded on. We started out, and on my discharge date, which would have been the 8th of September, we were eight days out from San Francisco on the way to Japan. And somebody said, we were, I said, where are we going? I said, we're going to Korea. I said, where in the hell's Korea? He said, I don't know, somewhere around Japan. I guess that's why we're going that way. Well, we went to Japan. We were there. Got there. Company all set up. We got to ordinance to draw the tanks to get them ready. I got down there. And they gave me my tank. I looked at that. Oh, it's Friday the 13th. Okay. It's 1 o'clock in the afternoon. What is that? Thirteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. What's the number of the tank? Thirteen. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, we got the black cat. <laughs> That's okay. And uh, but we we run break in on it's on the beach, just to get miles. And while we were doing that, and then the gunner and the and the loader, <clears throat> my assistant driver, they were cleaning up the the machine guns and the, the 76 cannon, getting the Cosmoline off. And we, I was just putting miles on to stretch the tracks so we could stretch them back, idle them, cut them back. And when we got ready to load out, we loaded out on the LST, backed everything in, dug, tightened it all down on the chains, and they got they assembled the whole company out on the dock. And they had a muster. And you, when they called your name off, you mm -hmm. went into the LST. The last one to go into that LST was the company commander, Captain Janowski. And there were two MPs standing right at the ramp. And my buddy said, snatch one of them. He said, we'll take him with us. <laughs> I, said, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> when we left there, we went, that's when we went to, we landed, it was in, uh, one son. And then we let, we got there, there was one building standing. And there was a barber shop. They had two chairs in it. And one of the tanks cut loose and blew that thing up too. Mm -hmm. So he said, I think we have nothing left. And we headed north. And that's when we were attached to the 7th Infantry Division. Now I was in the 3rd Infantry Division, 7th Infantry Regiment, Heavy Tank Company. And we were attached to the 7th Infantry Division on the east side of the peninsula. We were at one time about four miles from the Yellow River. And if you look at Korea, the north, you've got Russia, China, and Mongolia. Well, while we were up there, everybody said we're going home by Christmas. That's what MacArthur said. The war is over. And there was a lot of fighting going up that way. We got up there, and what nobody knew was China came in. They'd been there. They had infiltrated at night. Mm -hmm. We were outnumbered something like twenty to one at that point in time, and you're completely surrounded. Everything, the only thing that is way is the water. You can't get to it. You're in the mountains, right up at the reservoir, mm -hmm. the chosen reservoir. It was 40 below zero. Wow. Yeah, just keep the tanks running and shut them off for a little bit and start them right back up because they was afraid they wouldn't start and they might freeze up. So you're stuck inside of that ice box with just civilian, like civilian clothes. You got your fatigues. Well, I had on two pair of pants. 
two pair of socks, a field jacket, bio jacket. And you couldn't, we had to just bring your fatigue act because with a tank you got to have headsets you can't yeah. hear if you don't have. And oh, I never thought this, I never had any place where it was so cold in all my life. And then they started attacking. Nine times out of ten, it was going to be after dark. And it was 76 miles from there back down to Hung Nam. And I thought, it's going to be a long drive. Now, if you want a challenge, is to drive a tank, heavy tank, that width on an ox cart trail mm. down the mountain with one track partway on the, on the hill, the other one more or less almost on the edge of the road, and you look about a thousand feet straight down. Don't slip. Yeah, absolutely. And then you're fighting all the way. Mm -hmm. And we've, I, I'll be honest, I, I guess it's a gory sight, but I've never in my life seen so many dead people laying on top of the snow as I did up there. Were they primarily Chinese? Yes. Were, uh -huh. Most of the North Koreans had, had sprung into China. Mm -hmm. I had, you just see so much of it that you couldn't believe it. I mean, they come after us. In my impression only, if you're looking through that periscope, looking out, mm -hmm. see them coming, it looked like a great big ant hill had just exploded. I mean, it's covered as far as you can see. Yeah, that's what I've, I've told, been told. We're laying there with a 30 caliber machine gun. Every fifth round is a, is a, uh, a uh, what do you call it? Ah. Uh, tracer. Oh, mm-hmm. So you can tell at night exactly where that cell's going. When he, my assistant driver, is passing ammo up into the turret, I'd lay over the transmission and fire the 30 kilo. You know, then you just mow them down. The next bunch come along, grab the rifles, and keep coming, mow them down again. And it went on for hours. Mm -hmm. Is that all you had? Was a 30 caliber in there? In the bog gun, was a 30. The cannon was a 76 millimeter uh -huh. with a 30 mounted right up above the driver's head in the turret. And on top of the turret is a 50 caliber uh, machine gun. Mm -hmm. F-50 is a wicked gun. It sure is. Mm -hmm. I cut through a piece of wool that uh, yeah. dike that thick one night. I was on guard mm -hmm. and shot through that thing. I killed the guy who was on the other side of it. But I could not believe how that went through that mm -hmm. frozen ice. Were, were you, were you uh, supposed to be using the machine gun tool while you're driving? or No. no? My assistant driver did that. He's on the right oh, hand side the, mm -hmm. with the bog gun. But no, he was my sister driver was Japanese. Oh, is that right? Uh -huh. And it's, we called him Carbine. Because mm -hmm. it was a Carbine, he was dead eye dick. I mean, that kid could shoot. And nice young man. And I asked him one time, we were sitting there, and I said, Carbine, how did you ever end up in the Iraq Army? Well, he said, I came to Korea to visit my mother. She said, my dad got killed in World War II at Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was in the Merchant Marines from Japan. He said, I was visiting my mother, the Korean War broke out, and they dragged me into the Korean Army. And I said, well, that's pretty not different. And he said, I ain't half of it. He said, I can't speak Korean. <laughs> 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 real, real, real nice guy. Okay. He used to rape my mother, even. He was quite a guy. Mm. And we fought our way back down from from uh, the reservoir. It took, I think it was probably about 12 days, maybe, somewhere mm. in there. How long did it take to get up there? From yeah. I got there... Where, where did you land, by the way, did you say? In Wonsan. In Wonsan? Yeah, North, that's North Korea. That's, that's over on the... Uh, East Coast. East side, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the east side. And we went straight on up. We got up there. Oh, our fighting started up there. 
I don't know just how long it took to get all the way up to the reservoir, but I know on Thanksgiving, we had Thanksgiving dinner. Trucked in on a, on a mess truck. And I think I, I think the Chinese came in the next day or mm -hmm. awful close to that. <clears throat> we fought all the way back down to Hung Nam. And we got to Hung Nam. We, our company was up in the hill, mountain around the edge of the city and the port while the Marines were starting to load out. Now they evacuated something like 100,000 North Korean people, civilians, mm -hmm. along with. Well, the Marines all left. <clears throat> I think the last of them was about the 12th of December when they left. Because uh, I think they broke out November, yeah, November 1st, yeah, November, December. And they left and it was still taking people out and stuff and the Missouri was sitting down in the bay and she was sitting there broadside firing prettiest thing you ever saw in your life mm -hmm. on top of that hill the high hill late in the afternoon you could look down there and you'd see her fire and if you looked up you could see the shell go over your head go over your head yeah it would wait forever to hear the boom they had quite a range. 20 miles, they said they was pushing right. in. And then, <clears throat> they, after everybody was gone, they started loading everything out. And they assembled the company down on the beach. And the company commander said it was the lousiest, scrungiest looking bunch of people he ever saw in his life. Somebody in back of me says, it's okay, Captain, I said, I bet our face is a lot warmer than yours. <laughs> this face was beat red from the cold, and everybody had you had shaved, you had took a bath, mm -hmm. you had washed. You couldn't. You couldn't pick up a helmet full of water and you freeze where you yeah, get that. Right. And he says, "Well, is we're gonna haul defilade all the tanks because there's no more LSTs. Want you to fire your basic load of ammo." Destroy the tank, get in an LSM, and they'll bring you out to the bay, and we'll load you aboard a ship. So you had to destroy the tank? It was good to have to. About that time, I turned around here, look, up, went in. Dropped the ramp, gates open, dropped the ramp. The company commander looked, he said, Don't need to back him, and he says, Drive him in, just traverse the turrets to the rear. <laughs> that's what we did. We loaded up, locked them all down. It was day before Christmas, 24th of December. And I noticed that being with third tank in, it didn't take me long enough to go up on deck because they were still backing in or driving in. The last tank pulled in, he hadn't even completely tied down. And the ramp came up and the front end closed up and it was backing out. And it was up on top of the deck and we looked and all the stuff that we couldn't take, they piled on the beach. And it was as high as, dirty as high as that two-story house there. Jeeps, cannons, food, everything, supplies. Just didn't have the room for it. Mm -hmm. And I think they had seven, seven people left there to demol to, for demolition. And out of the seven, I think five of them got killed before they ever got off the beach. Mm -hmm. And when they blew that thing up, if you ever watch the, the History Channel, sometimes they, they had that on there at one time. And you see that big explosion on the beach. It looked like the biggest Fourth of July you ever saw. I mean, it was just something out of this world. So Christmas Day, we was aboard that LST, and we had grilled cheese sandwiches, and we had tomato soup. Tasted just like T-bone steak and mm, mashed potatoes. First hot meal we'd had in you know, forever. Even got to take a shower, get cleaned up. Now, from that point on, there seemed to be, you know, the Americans would take one hill and then the Chinese would take, you know, I mean, it was back kind of a forth. back and forth yeah, thing. Was. 
See, we went from Hung Nam, and they brought us on down and dug on it. Dropped the ramp and it was a Japanese LST, and we unloaded, and it was a it was a summer resort. Oh, mm -hmm. And I thought, what the heck? Well, we were just there about two days. We heard people in the hills. We thought it was our guys. Mm -hmm. It was the Chinese. Oh, uh huh. And about oh, just before dark or daylight, LST came in. Company commander out and blew us so everybody fell out. Load back up, just drive in. And I thought, how are you going to get this thing sitting on the beach? It's kind of, kind of dry. And all of a sudden, after everybody got aboard, started moving on out. Well, I talked to Dixie's uncle. He was on an LST. Yeah. I said, how do they do that? Yeah. He said, they drop the anchor way on, way on out. And he said, and if they get on land is dry, he said, they just wish yourself back out. Mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out how they ever did that. But anyway, then we went, they picked us up and they took us on south. We was north of Pusan. And then we started to, to fight back north again. Mm -hmm. And when I remember, I was there to help them take the Seoul the second time. And when we went through Seoul, I got there was the buildings there was nothing there, it was just all blown out and burning and we were fighting in the door to door and we got through there, we got ready to cross the Han River <coughs> with the tanks. Of course there's no bridges, so they made one. They had uh, rafts, mm -hmm. mesh on yeah. engineers. To make all the crews walk across. He said the drivers drive across. He said, but don't try to make any quick moves. Yeah, you know the That's why everybody's walking across. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't take long to figure that one out. Well anyway, we all got across, no problem. But it was a, a wild thing and then we fought there. And then we started to, we'd take a hill and they'd take it back. We'd take one and we did, they call it an airstrike. Yeah. What, what kind? What would you do? How would you involve a tank in that kind of fighting back and forth? It would well, seem to me that it would be primarily um, uh, infantry. Oh no! Well, the infantry is there. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we work in support. They want to go up the hill. We start at the top of the hill with the cannons. Oh, I see. And we fire up, and then they'd call in an airstrike a lot of times. And when they did that, <clears throat> we'd have some pilot there that would be in the tank, and he'd call the airstrike in. Mm -hmm. Now that was, we showed him how to load the cannon in case we had, gotten, had to use him. Mm -hmm. It is usually a captain or a lieutenant, a lot of times it's even a colonel. And they'd call in the airstrike, they'd call in the mother hen and their chicks. Well, now when that airstrike started on that hill, you could open the hatches and sit up on top and watch it. Huh? Mm -hmm. they start raking that thing right at the bottom of the hill and they'd rake it right straight up and roll over and do the other side. Yes, Fantastic job. Mm -hmm. you watch them, as long as they was going to the left, it's coming back for another run. If they went to the right, that was going to be the end of the end of the airstrike. You better get back down sight because we're going to start again. Mm -hmm. And it would. <laughs> but when they get through with it, they drop that napalms, and you can see that shell hit the ground, and bounce up, and go up near probably I'd say a good thirty feet, and then it would explode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the whole hill would be on fire. So we roasted a lot of them. No doubt in my mind. But to watch them, it was it was amazing to see how they did that. Mm -hmm. We had a, then a, we would give support for the infantry. If they went up the hill, we went up the hill. With your tank? Yes. And I could put it up any hill they wanted. Is that right? You bet. 
Yeah, in the spring, in the spring we got on the one hill, and that thing was so steep that I'd make a run at it, and it was way back there, you really want you tight to the drum, and downshift as you're going up, and I'd jump the track off every time, and you have to jump it back on, just too steep. So we had to go around the other side of the hill and come up the back side. Well, we got up on top there, and all stationed up there, one whole platoon. We were up there with F Company, Fox Company. Fox Company, we was in support of quite a lot. <clears throat> now, one from Chelsea here was Louis Birch. He used to do, own the pool room. Mm -hmm. I seen him walk by, my assistant driver said, hey, here comes Sigmin Reed. I looked, he was marching the platoon by, I looked. I said, hell, that's Louis Birch. I yelled Birch just as he yelled Wing. Mm -hmm. oh, and then we got going on there. Well, and we, they were our, we were supporting them all the time. And on top of the hill, you could see way off in the distance, you could see them assembling over there. You could see dust, you could see trucks. They said, well, the spring offensive is going to start here before long because the big one was up north. This is going to be the next big one. No doubt. Mm -hmm. And is waiting, I think, for the for their yearly thing, whatever they do it on the super date. And when they come in, they started. And I never. And by then, because it's summertime, you can have the hatch open and hear them damn bugles. Mm -hmm. And you hear the screaming. And hear the yelling. And see flares going up, different color ones. That was their, their signal of what's going on, for where to go. They start coming up towards you, set up there and just mow it down. And they just keep on, keep on. And God darn it, they didn't turn around and end up. Finally, eventually, they broke loose on the other flank of us. And on the other one also. So we come up over the top of our hill, that's where we overran us. And tank commander said, okay, Jerry, he said, no. He said, we're going downhill. He said, don't forget, he said, there's four more of us in here besides you. <laughs> I told him, I said, do we? I said, you got to hang on. He was the best tank commander in the, I think, in the whole company. He was in the World War II vet. And that old boy knew tanks. He was good. So I edged it up to the edge. And then I just uh, fell it when it dropped off the other side. I put it in third gear, both feet up on that front slope, and the lad rolls right back in my lap, and I bet I was doing 30 mile an hour down the hill. Wow. In running, third I, gear? Oh, yeah. I was running over I was running over the Chinese. I mean, I don't know how many I just flat ran over. So you get down to the bottom. You know, I was scared to death I was going to, you know, jump a belt, fan belt. You know what I mean? It could have happened. It had a big old Ford engine in it, the 500 horsepower. Looked like two V8s welded together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked down at the temperature gauge, they about the same. So we get on the bottom, and I was getting ready to leave the tank. Tank commander said, Whoa, wait, 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 wait. He said, Second tank, tank number two. He said, he jumped the track and couldn't get back on. They're coming down the hill. We'll carry road. Take them with us. I waited for them to come down. The driver of the second of that tank, he was shot about four times. The driver? <laughs> yeah, we put him on the inside on the bog gun, bog gunner seat. And my assistant driver, he come on and sat on the transmission. And the rest of the guys all got inside, so there's ten of us inside of the tank. Now, five is, five is company and ten's a crowd. Yeah. So we started on back out and I started picking wounded up putting on the back of the tank. And all of a sudden we looked down here and there's shell on the center of the road. You got the river on that side, you got the hill on this side. You ain't but one way out. So I got counting the number between each shell that went off. And I thought I had that down perfect, you know, 1,001 and so on. And I said, I got this one down perfect. 
So we started on out, I had second gear, get third gear, he reached out like that, hit fourth gear and that shell went off right there. It was a great big bowl of fire, I remember that. And the next thing I know, they're pulling me up out of the turret, or out of my seat. I shook them loose. And I found out later, my tank commander called the company commander, first platoon sergeant, or leader. He said, I got a dead driver. And he said, well, don't leave him up there, bring him out. He thought you were dead? Yeah, he thought I was dead because of all the blood running down from my face. Because I had the hatch open. You got to see where you're going at 2 yeah. o'clock in the morning. And I thought, well, I wonder if we blew the track off. So I started real easy. Looked like it was all right. Come on back down and right where he had to cut back over into the river. Went on that for a ways. I picked up some more wounded. And the Chinese were on top of that damn banks and they were shooting down. And the guys on the outside, the ones that were wounded the worst were laying on top of the ones that wasn't rooted yet the way as hard. And we got back out on the main supply route now, the 64th. Tank battalion was sporting, set up the resistance for us. I got back out and I said, where's the 64th tank battalion? I said, well, said, they left a long time ago. He said, you're all set. He said, we got the main line set up. When I got ready to come up onto the road, the thing wouldn't turn left for nothing. I thought, no, God. Finally, I got turned and got up onto the road, pulled on back ways, and then there, there was just jeeps all over the place. Red Cross trucks, they were picking up wounded. And I had something like 10 or 12 on the outside, plus the 10 inside. And the outside of that tank looked like a bloodbath when I seen it in the daylight. So the tank commander said, well, he said, we got to head back. And they said, Josh, said, what damage are we doing? He said, I don't know, I said, look. Walked around the tank and right, that shell evidently went off right under my seat. Because he said the tank flipped like that and backed down. And it blew the whole front suspension on the oh. side right out. The bogey wheels, the shocks, the whole thing, there was nothing there. I said, that's why the old girl didn't want to turn. I know. And a chunk of the sprocket was gone. So we rumbled on back and got back to the 10th field artillery, pulled in there with them. So I got my tool bag out and I got there. Sockets all and stuff. I started going around the track. Well, there's quite a few of the wedge nuts were loose, but not broke. So we wandered on back to our company. And then they sent me down to ordinance. And just take time going down. Got down there and oh, we'll fix it right up. No problem, it's right at the river. Well, there's this guard guy who was there with the tank company. He said, you know, you play it right. He said, when the parts come in, he said, you throw it in the river. He said, they won't find it. <laughs> he said, I've been down here 10 days. That's, I don't think I want to do that. It does, this is only there, I think it was just about a day or a day and a half, not any more than that. And he got me all put back together, put new tracks on it, both sides. And I rolled on back to our company. I got back to our company, and then we went right back online. We stayed online. We'd be on there for a, a month. And then we could come back at night and spend one night in a reserve area and pull maintenance on the tanks, resupply the ammo and fuel, change oil and so on, and a good night's sleep and a hot meal and a hot breakfast. After breakfast, you went back up and see where you left, and that platoon would come back. Were they able to to uh, fix your tank up? Yep. Oh. But just like brand new, the old girl run like a rabbit. Oh, uh huh. She was a runner. But they, you know, it, 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 some people. I got ready. I knew I was coming home. And tank commander said, "Well, he's why don't you ride?" Shotgun and said, let Carol drive. And I said, okay. Because he said, somebody's going to have to replace you and I both. And he said, he's supposed to be your assistant driver. And I said, okay. 
I'll send the girl sitting there and she's shaking her head. Oh, the hatch. I said, what's the matter with you? She's like over there with a 500 pounder. Oh, I'm laying there, right by the bridge. I said, I said swap seats. Nope, it was just laying there. <laughs> he's, he's done past it. And he said, oh, she can make a leap. And I said, okay, you just stay there. And when we came back, he was on patrol. And when we came back, somebody had disarmed it then. Uh -huh. But it was live. It was laying there. It was a dud. It never got off. It was a dud. When they were, sh when you were trying to dodge that shelling, was that American or? or I think it was. Ch our, Ch I almost think it was our 10th field artillery. Uh -huh. I wouldn't say that for positive. Well, you know. Don't get me I wrong. But. Uh, the Chinese use more mortars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now this had to be artillery to blow that thing, that, that steel part like that. Yeah. A, a mortar round would never do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I kind of understood the Chinese being more mobile and the, the mortars would make that possible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you know, we had uh, the, the, the Chinese, they were good fighters, don't no, get me wrong. But I could not figure out unless they were all hopped up on juice or what. Because who in the heck in the right mind would challenge a tank head on with all that firepower? Well, and not bad an eyeball. That's not too different than what the Russians did. You know, the, unfortunately, uh, uh, life was expendable. Oh, yeah. The Russians and probably the same thing with the Chinese. It was the same way with the Chinese. Yeah. Now, one night or one day, they always, their fighting was a lot at night. And then one day, the whole woods was moving. Shrubs. And looking down there says, what, what doesn't look right with this picture? <laughs> and pretty soon here comes the airstrike. Everybody started firing over that hill. You fire over here, you fire over there, you fire down here. The airstrike come in, and we annihilated the camouflage. And you know what was under that camouflage? About 2,000 anybody. Wow. So we killed every one of them. That was the biggest grave sight you ever saw. Terrible thing to look at. I can still picture it just as plain as mm. day. Still get them stupid nightmares sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You think it'd all go away, but you know they don't. No, it doesn't. And every spring, nine times out of ten, right up, in, even last year yet, I cut my finger. Reach up there, out comes a piece of shrapnel. Hmm. Now that's even years spent? and years. That, yeah. was, that was back in 1951. Yeah. And she said, you sure that's what it is? And I said, take that magnet and see what happens. Yeah. Pop it right up. She said, it is. <laughs> but it's this year, you sit back. Weird. Weird, weird. Did, what kind of an award did, what kind of awards did you get? You got Purple I got, Heart, I would hope. No, I didn't. And the reason I didn't, because I didn't go to the medics. You're kidding. No, I had my frostbitten feet. I mean, it was numb. Yeah. And we was at, up at the reservoir. And I was seeing the medic there and I told him what was going on. He said, well, can you feel them? And I said, feel like two logs. And I guess, that was the first time I could get out of the tank. And I'm walking around. Finally, I got to where I could feel them again. And he said, you know, he said, Sergeant, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, you're going to, he said, take your socks. And he said, how do you keep your socks? I said, I got one pair under each armpit. And I said, I take one pair off and I put the dry ones mm -hmm. underneath. He said, well, you keep doing that. And he said, they start to turn color. He said, no, come on back, we'll send you back. Because what they're going to do is they'll just take you back there, warm your feet and send you back. I said, it's all right with me, I don't want it. So I didn't go back. But I did file for it here a few years back, 
and I do get disability. Uh, you do? Uh -huh. Both legs and both feet. What, what about for the shrapnel? Nothing? No, I never went through that. Ex Tank commander allowed me to go because I couldn't hear. Totally deaf. And the second day, the third day, he wrote me a note. He said, you got to go to the medics. You got, he said, you can probably go home. And I said, don't talk so loud. He said, what do you mean? I said, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. He said, I thought you was a goner. Mm -hmm. He said, you had a million dollar wound. They'd send you home. I said, no, they wouldn't. They'd have done the same thing. They'd have you there a couple of days, see if you could hear, and they'd let you go back. How long did you stay in Korea itself? Just about a year. Just yeah? Uh huh. Uh, close to. I left there. Let's see. I left there. The must have been the about the first of August. Uh -huh. I think we got there and got I can't remember. October oh, okay. maybe somewhere in that area. Did, uh, how'd you get back home? Did they, they... Came back on the, uh, we got back to, I'll tell you, I got ready to come home. They called my name off, and they called Shields, and Larry, and another one. Go to the company commander. We went in. He said, oh, I said, you guys are going home in the morning. So pack everything up, turn everything in. Well, before you go, he said, our platoon leaders are all about ready to go home, too. If you guys will re-enlist after you get home, a 30-day furlough at home, and travel on us, re-enlist, refill your own vacancy, you come back, we're going to make all four of you second lieutenants and people platoon leaders. He's done offering you something on a plate. He said, really think about it. Well, next morning I threw my bag on the truck, crawled up and didn't do something after that. Crawled up and sat down in the seat and turned around and looked. He was standing there shaking his head. Here come the other three. He came up to the truck and he said, oh, come on guys. He said, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> they my, thought about it. My says, Captain, you know, he said, they've tried to kill us for a year. So far, he said, we've been hurt, some of us. But he said, we're not dead, and we don't want to give him a second chance. He said, I can understand. Mm -hmm. So I got back to the third Ripple Depot, and they had to dump your double bags. Well, I had a burp gun in there that I picked off a dead chink. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, they kept that. They said that they, I could take it home, but they'd have to fill it with lead. I said, if it won't work, I don't want it. <laughs> so they got that. I got out of there, I turned around and looked, and here's Louis Burt standing there. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going home. I said, so am I. Well, we damn. So we got back to the well, we was there for two days. One camp on this side of the hill, there's a camp on the other side of the hill. All tents. And all of a sudden, here comes the siren. Everybody got out of the tent and run out and lay down there in the grass. Here come Bed Check Charlie, good old boy with his old biplane. He come rumbling on over and he bombed the hell out of the hill. Didn't hit anybody. He left. I said, yeah, be glad we don't have to look out for him every night. <laughs> he did up, up north. Same thing. And this one was sitting in the back seat. He said, there he's throwing mortars out. That was his Bed Check. He knew he was coming, but he never hit any of us. Mm -hmm. And I seen that in the paper afterwards that somebody shot him down. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was too bad. He was a pretty nice guy, I guess. But anyway, <clears throat> we got back there, we got back on the train, and we headed for Pusan. Well, on the way down from to Pusan, we were way up by the 38th parallel. On the way back down, train stopped out in the middle of nowhere, and the engineer and another guy gets out, they go up to this house. Said, What's going on? Somebody says, oh, he says, that's their, that's where their wife is, they're stopping to eat. Oh. Says, They've done this before. Uh -huh. <laughs> we rumble on down, we get to Pusan, got a board ship, 
we got back into Japan, and if we got off board ship, we got, got north that you could sit there, and you could go through the, the line at the PX and you could get a can of beer until it's gone, one can each. Well, Louie and I was running through there getting a can. We came back, I hear somebody says, you want to come up here with me? We said, we're all going together. Turn around, look, here's right. My buddy gets there. Hmm. I said, whoa, I hadn't seen him. He was in there, he was in the engineers. So the three of us started going back and forth too. Then we stashed them underneath the barrack steps. <laughs> we drew straws to see who was going to make the phone call and call back home. We just let our mothers know that it was coming. They were all right. Louie got the short straw. So we all chipped in so he could make the phone call. He came back, he's there. He said, now Louie, did you tell him that Roy and I are coming back to him? Damn, he said, I forgot. <laughs> she probably will do it anyway. <laughs> okay, all three of us came back on the same ship. It was the General Minx. And when it left, when we left Japan, it was 5,550 troops on there. We came back up around the Aleutian Islands and came into Seattle. And when we came in, the ship that left there before us was in the bay anchored. They were under quarantine. Somebody had a monkey was taken back with them. And they didn't know if it was rabied or not. Mm. So we went past them. And they had the old uh, fire boats were shooting water, and a couple of jets was flying over. It was kind of a nice walk. Mm -hmm. And we come up to the dock, and then, of course everybody got off. And we went out, I can't think of the port up there. Actually, anyway, Roy and Louie and I went up on the top of the hill at night so we could see lights. When we came in, they announced it. The captain said, oh, he said, we're just coming into Puget Sound. You want to see the lights of the United States? He said, come take a look. Well, everybody bailed up on the one side of the ship to look out. It was really a beautiful sight to see. And one guy fell overboard, so we had to stop. They had to fish him back out. Now the captain said, now everybody stay back. He said, this about two feet from the from the rail from your end. So we did. But on the way over, you know, we got so rough. Yeah. It was, well, those two of us was up on the, right on the bow of the ship. And if you look over to the side, you could see the phantoms. And every time they, they come back up, you could see more of them. So, man, I wonder how far we can see. And down, he said, so I'm gonna come back up. You look, you can see the hook. Yeah. So holy oh, mackerel, when it came down, it took uh, him and I washed it right off of that deck, right down onto the next one. The next deck, the guys was playing poker. Mm -hmm. It took them and their money. And all <laughs> the money went overside. And he said, they, they, right away they put the big flag up. No, you can't go up on the ball anymore. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of different. Did, were you discharged immediately? Or? No. no. I came home and I got in the... Uh, well, they put us aboard a train, and I came to, I came back into Colorado, Camp mm -hmm. Carson. And we got there and said, you don't pull KP, you don't pull guard. You sit around and relax. And I said, hey, no way am I going to do that and sit here until the 8th of September and do that, because this was in August, in the middle of August. <clears throat> well, it took us 10 days to get home. Mm -hmm. but it took us much more than that to go over because we took a zigzag course. We're well, coming home, we were straight back. Yeah. And I thought, that was this business. So I went and got me a, a train ticket. He gave me a three-day pass. I said, don't forget, three-day pass, don't worry about it. Just be back here in time to get discharged. And I said, well, I was got a train. I called my mother when I was in Chicago. She said, we'll be up to Jackson and pick you up. I said, okay. 
Well, I heard my brother was at the station in Jackson when I got there and got off the train and this lady come running over and she said, Sergeant, Sergeant, Sergeant. She said, have you seen my son? I said, I, I, said, I don't think so. She said, well, he's supposed to, I think he may be going to be coming home. She said, I check every train. And she said, are you sure you haven't seen him? I said, no, I haven't. This kid come running up towards me, and I thought, who the heck is he? He's my brother. I couldn't, I didn't recognize him. He groped. I, I recognized my mother. We came back to town here, and it was terrible. I seen one guy walking up on Main Street. And I told her, you know, I said, Mom, I said, I think I'm going to re-enlist. I fill my own vacancy. I can come back as an officer. I might make a career out of it. Well, she had a fit. Because my, my dad died when I was eight years old. My brother was two when he passed away. And I kind of had I pretty well looked out for my mom and my grandmother. She lived with us. And I got thinking. Well, maybe not. We'll see what happens. I said, Mom, you ever been to Colorado? She said, never. I said, I got two buddies that's in Pontiac. I said, Lions and Shields. I said, they're going to ride back with us. I said, we're going to drive that car back. So I took them and had those two guys. Pet Betsy was the other one in Shields. And we drove all the way on back out to Colorado Springs and out to the Cape oh, Carson. And I put my mother and brother up in the guest house. And she said, well, what are we going to do? I said, I'm going to take you up and make speak. And she said, oh, that needs something different. So we went up and speak. Got up to the top. Beautiful, beautiful sight from up there. Going right, right through the clouds on the way up. We got up there and they're looking around and these walking out shop and this young guy there and his wife and he said, I bet you I can meet you down this hill. I said, I bet you can. And he said, I'll meet you down at the restaurant on the bottom. I said, okay. We lined up and took off and I got him to jump on him. Down the hill we started. Well, I got down to about 12 mile marker and I pulled off the side. Mother said, what are you doing? I said, that cop wants to talk to me. I <laughs> laid up back there. The old boy was really shook up. He said, I'll take you right on my lawn. And I said, I don't care, you can have this mountain. I'm going home tomorrow. He said, you get out of second gear. He said, you're good. He said, I'm going to take you right off. And I said, okay, I won't. He said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just a little bit late for the hill climb. They had the race last week. And I said, I'm just late entering. He said, get out of here. <laughs> so we went down the bottom of the hill, and the guy never did see him. I don't know. His wife got scared or something. And then we, we came back here. I got discharged. And we came back. And I thought, I got to make up my mind what I want to do. Yeah. And I came back in town. I went up town, this dairy bar, had a cup of coffee, cigarette. Got the car and came back down to the house and the phone ring. I answered the phone. Jerry? I said, yeah. He says, Nick Elzer. I said, how are you doing, Richard? He said, I'll be there to pick you up at 2 30 in the real morning. He said, let's go back to work. And I'm up. Well, I drove for a deck before I went in the hurry. It's at produce company. And I got I told my mother, I said, I didn't want to go to work this quick. I wanted to lay around. <laughs> sure enough, 2.30, he was out in front of the house blowing the horn, so I got in. We went down to Detroit Union Produce and started loading up. Well, I made up my mind then, I guess I just better stay home. So I did. And I started going with my wife, and I came home. I drove for him for about a year. And I went to work down here at the Federal Screw Works, which isn't there no more. That's oh, okay. where they tore it down. My mother worked there for over 40 years. And I worked there for, I was on the, the shop for, I don't know, a couple months anyway. 
And then Mr. Booker, who my mother said, he's working too hard. I'm going to bring him up here in the office. They offered me a job in the office. And budget it and then uh, cost the estimation department. Well, I tried that and it was terrible. That room just got smaller and smaller and the roof come down. And I tried to Mr. Booker, I said, I got I to gotta leave. I, I, I slept outside for a year. Mm. Now you stick me in a building, I can't can't do that. So I I, I, I quit. He gave me, I gave him two weeks notice. He offered me a good job in Detroit. I turned it down. Then I went and bought a gas station out here on the corner of my uh, Comball Road. It used to be the uh, Hilltop Sonoma. It had a restaurant, Carlson's had that next door. Is there almost no, quite a while, less than a year. And then the state came in and said that I-94 was coming through. Mm -hmm. And they'd make an easy on, easy off exit for our gas station. Well, I knew Mr. Smith wasn't going to put up a gas station. He's 87 years old. And we were written from it. So I went out to Chrysler for my application and they hired me. I worked out there for 35 years. Wow. Her and I got married in 54. Yeah, 1954. Right. <clears throat> we had two girls. Elizabeth and Sarah. What are they doing now, Jim? Beth passed away. I'm sorry? Beth passed away. Oh. She had a heart attack. She was down in Columbus <coughs> at her daughter's house with a grand grandson, her granddaughter. She had a heart attack down there. And Sarah lives over in the pool now, my youngest daughter. And then she, Beth had two kids, Matt and Jen. Jennifer's got a daughter. Matthew has a son and daughter. Our youngest daughter, she has two children. 